Join me today on Walk With History as we talk about the Battle of Yorktown from Yorktown, Virginia. So we are in the visitor center here at the Yorktown battlefield. And this is run by the National Park Service. They have a great little exhibit area when you first walk in. This is very interesting about the Purple Heart and Yorktown. So the Purple Heart is established at Yorktown. It's actually established by George Washington in 1782. He wanted to do something for military merit, especially since Alexander Hamilton had decided with his group to take the bullets out of their gun to siege one of the blockades. And he did that so a stray gunshot wouldn't give them away for what they were doing. And because he felt people acted heroically and got injured in that, that's when the Purple Heart was developed. So the Purple Heart actually comes out of Yorktown. They have a great little recreation of the area here, so you can look at it. But what my kids are very interested in is a recreation of one of the uh, ships that are used in the battle. So as we talked about there, the French come down here early in October and they come to the lower Chesapeake with tons of troops and ships and the British come and fight them and they actually, the French are victorious and the British go back to New York. And so this is a recreation of one of the ships. So they have a really cool creation in here of like, this is the back of the ship is most likely captain's quarters. So this is where the captain would sit and eat. So the only person on the ship who's gonna be afforded a room like this is gonna be the captain. So this is where the captain would be more than likely. And here is a recreation of what a typical sailor would get. So a sailor would sleep in a hammock just like this. Notice how it's over the cannon. So this is how a sailor would sleep. You could fold it up when he wasn't sleeping. He, and they'd be folded up kind of like this and then fold it out when they were sleeping. So this is a really great creation. I would say these ceilings are a little higher than they would be on an actual ship. You would really be hunched over in an actual wow. ship. Uh, they do this probably for tourists so you could walk through here with no problems. I know, and then look. This is, that's where they would keep all the stores, all the goods, Tanner, and they would lock them up so people couldn't get to them and eat the crackers and drink the water when they shouldn't be. So again, another recreation of what it would look like down here. This is a little lower, but really in real life, this would be a lot lower. So this is really great. This is, this is the tent. This is a recreation of George Washington's tent. So we have talked about George Washington's tent before. Oh, they have the tent at the American Revolution Museum in Philadelphia. And they have that tent because of Selma Gray from Arlington, who saved it because her, George Washington's ancestor was married to Robert E. Lee. And when the Union came to siege her home in Arlington, she left without a bunch of things. And one of them was George Washington's tent. So her enslaved woman saved the tent and the tent went into other people's hands throughout time, but now it's in the American Revolution Museum in Philadelphia. So this is a recreation of what the tent would have looked like as well. What his headquarters, he would dine in tents like this, and they have recreated that. So you can kind of see what that would look like on the field and what it would look like to be in it. So George Washington stood approximately six foot two, the same height as the tunnel. So as you can see, George Washington would be just a little bit taller. And then this is what his tent would have looked like with his table and his trunk. I actually saw his trunk at um, Mount Vernon. So if you want to see his trunk, it's at Mount Vernon. And then set up for tables to, to eat and to serve, but mostly to plan and to sleep, things along that nature. So this is another neat artifact they have here at the National Park Service Visitor Center, Cornwallis's campaign table. So as you know, Cornwallis is the leader of the British Army here in Yorktown. And this is his campaign table, was thought to have belonged to him. When they say thought to have belonged to him, that means they don't have exacting records, but enough evidence that points to it. And it's, of course, um, protected by the plexiglass, but it can be folded and unfolded, can change heights. 
so it probably can be used for a bunch of different purposes. This is a very interesting picture here in the visitor center, and it talks about Lafayette with his servant, James Armstead Lafayette. And what's interesting about this picture is the musical Hamilton. So in the musical Hamilton, the song Yorktown, they talk about Mulligan being the spy and getting all the intel. It isn't Mulligan who gets the, all the intel. It's actually Lafayette's servant, James Armstead. He pretends to be enslaved. He pretends to be a servant and he gets the intel. That's the true story. This is the real person. And then Lafayette leaves after the battle. Armstead is put back into enslavement. Lafayette comes back to America, notices how bad his lifestyle is, has him emancipated, and Armstead, as a way of honoring Lafayette for doing that, takes his last name. So that song is actually wrong for who they're getting their intel from, because they're actually getting their intel from him. So small distance away from the National Park Service Visitor Center is the Yorktown Victory Monument. So of course they want to commemorate their victory. So not long after the victory, this is about 10 days later, they authorize a monument to be built to commemorate their victory. Uh, construction began 100 years later and completed in 1884. So basically after the government gets established, money gets found, it gets built 100 years later. The figure of liberty on top, it says it's severely damaged by lightning and it's replaced. So liberty, that Statue of Liberty is also on top of the Capitol. So that's what's on top of the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. is liberty. So when people always ask, like, who is that on the top? That's what it is. But let's go over and look at the, um, the top of the statue. So this is the York River out here, and this is what Cornwallis does as his last ditch effort to try to not be overtaken by the rebels, as he tries to, at night, get all the ships and boats and cross this point at the York River. And he tries to, it's Gloucester, Gloucester Point he tries to make it to. And that night a really bad storm comes in and they can't get the boats in the water. And that's when he feels like all hope is lost. The so next day he will surrender. So this is, the, this is the area though, where he's gonna try to cross, that the weather is gonna be so bad and it's, it's gonna be, the, the officers are gonna try to get their boats in the water and they're gonna have to just turn around. So when you go to Yorktown, you can take the battlefield tour and you're gonna stop at markers like this and they're gonna be marked in alphabetical order. And this is the first one. This is the British inner defense line all around the city of Yorktown. So Cornwallis had made his base here. He had been here for a while. And this defense line was around the city of York, most of Yorktown. Most of the whole houses in Yorktown were destroyed, used as full, except for Nelson. Nelson is one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Actually, in 1774, him and a group of people get into the Yorktown Harbor and throw tea into the harbor protesting just like they did in Boston. So Cornwallis doesn't destroy his home. I don't know if it's to send a message, but Nelson's home is the one home that doesn't get destroyed. So you just follow these markers and it's almost like a Gettysburg type thing where you're going to drive around the whole battlefield. So when you do this battlefield tour, all the red lines are going to be for the British side. 
It's gonna do the British side of the battlefield first, and then it's gonna go yellow, and the yellow is gonna be all the Allied side. So Allied, in this case, would be America and France. So this is the second stop. This is the siege line. So what is happening here is we saw the British line. So this is where the Allies come in, the, the Americans and the French, and they start digging. And this is after Washington has met with Rochambeau and they decided we're not gonna attack New York, we're actually gonna come down here and we're gonna attack Yorktown. Uh, the British fleet tries to come here and they're actually pushed back by the French. And so this is where they dig in and they're gonna start to dig closer and closer. And they're gonna try to take two strategic points, rebounds nine and 10. And in those two posts, the French take nine and actually it's Alexander Hamilton who takes 10. And as we talked before, Alexander Hamilton will make everyone take the bullets out of their guns and get as close as they can. They actually have less casualties than the French when they take uh, nine because they get so close up, no one knows that they're there. But these still exist. These trenches that they dug, this still exists. This is all real. This is all what they dug in, and you see where this kind of trench warfare comes from. But this is as close as they try to get. And you can see it all, all these mounds, these was all, this was all made by the Americans and the French. Got their cannon set up. So this still exists today. And we're looking over into Yorktown. And then you can see that you can stop here with your car uh, on the driving tour. So this is kind of how Yorktown is set up so you can visit all of these things and it sets it up in a way much like Gettysburg where you can see the battlefield. Stop three is the Yorktown National Cemetery. So the Yorktown National Cemetery actually is for Civil War dead. So when this area was sieged with battle during the Civil War, they buried all these Union soldiers out here. They said there's over 2,000 burials, two thirds remain unknown and only about 750 are identified. So this is the second siege line, the second Allied siege line. We're here, that's the first one. That's where we were at right before, where the uh, cannons were. And then this is the second siege line. So there's two siege lines that they're making. And remember I had talked about those Union soldiers are buried between, or their, the Civil War soldiers are buried between the two siege lines. So that's where that cemetery falls between the two siege lines. So here's the first parallel that they're digging in. And here is the second. The French is making this, and then this is when they're gonna take these two British redoubts right over here. This is what's gonna seal the fate of the Battle of Yorktown. I mean, this, this siege area is much like the first one with digging in the trenches right, for cannon fire. You have these two lines here. They ask that you stay on the path to preserve the earthworks. So this is the big part, the readouts nine and 10. Take the bullets out your guns, the bullets out your guns. We move under cover and we move as one. This is where this happens. So nine, this is uh, taken on October 14th, 1781. Readout nine is taken by the French. Readout 10 is taken by the Americans with Alexander Hamilton. And he's the one who tells them to take the bullets out of their gun. I'm telling you because readout 10 was right along the water that parts of it and most of it were washed away at sea during 175 years of a crumbling seawall. So we're not gonna see much of readout 10 because of that, but it's right here to the left. And I think you can see the sign. We are kind of right on the water. I can see it right over there. And this is the one that was taken over by Alexander Hamilton and his group of Americans. And the, the picture they have here is actually Alexander Hamilton right here. Predominantly African-American unit, Second Rhode Island. 
They must have helped him assault this. But this is what the readout looked like. So you can see the, the spikes here, and they must have been inside of it, where they would have their artillery and their cannons. And so for 400 to take 70, you know, again, numbers are in your favor. And they took the bullets out of their guns so they could get as close as possible, not letting anybody kind of know they were on their way. What's interesting about this is it says Alexander Hamilton and Lawrence. You used to hear the musical Hamilton, and he talks about Lawrence being in South Carolina. La Lawrence wasn't in South Carolina. Lawrence was with him during this fight. So that is again another thing that is wrong in the musical Hamilton. But this actually says it right here that Lawrence and Hamilton are actually fighting this together when they take. Uh, so here's Redoubt 9. You can see the same spikes, wooden spikes coming out of it. So this is the one that the French come and take over and, and are able to take over. So when you walk to these, not as easy to tell where you're going. Um, we kind of like wandered off a little bit. Visitor Center is right there. So you can see it's right over there. So this is nine. So can you imagine 120 British soldiers inside here were attacked by 400 Frenchmen on October 14th, 1781. This is readout nine. This is the one you're allowed to go inside of. So you can see 120 were inside here. Maybe over here on this pedipet was a cannon, but this is where the 120 stood that night when they were overcome by the French. So this was George Washington's headquarters here during the Battle of Yorktown. He had two tents set up in this vicinity. One of them was to have meetings and planning and to eat. The other one was his private tent. That private tent, again, is at the American Revolution Museum in Philadelphia. The other one, I'm not sure where it's at. I think they have a recreation of it in the visitor center here and a piece of it, the actual one in the visitor center here. But this picture depicts of what it would have looked like. And this is him actually planning the attacks on the redoubts of nine and 10. So this is how far out he is. When you do the driving tour of the Yorktown battle, anything that has to do with the allies, so America and France will be in yellow anything to do with the British or in red. Most of the attacks, the surrender, the negotiation is in red. This area though is in yellow. This is what, probably the most interesting place to come to, to get to see where George Washington actually was, where he made his plans. As you drive out here, it's a pretty bit a ways away and there's other major figures campsites that you'll stop at so you will see just how protected George Washington is by his troops that there are many troops you have to go through to get to his tent. So this is the Moore House. On October 18th four officers met here. One French, one American, and two British and they negotiated the surrender of the Battle of Yorktown. This was done October 18th. The surrender happened October 17th. And as you remember, readouts nine and 10 were taken October 14th. So this is all happening in secession pretty quickly. Uh, Washington was not part of that meeting. The officers that met here just negotiated what would happen in the surrender. This is about a mile outside of the city of Yorktown. And this is the other view from the Moore House. You can see right on the water as well. So right through those two trees, they have water access. And the house hasn't changed that much. So this is a part of the battlefield called Surrender Field. So this talks about on the 17th is when the surrender took place at 10 o'clock. They raised the white flag on their walls, they beat a drum. So a drummer came out and started beating the drum, and then an officer came out with the white flag. And then the terms of surrender were agreed upon, like at the Moore House that we just went to on the 18th with the four officers. And then Washington Cornwallis signed off on that agreement, and everything took place on the 19th, October 19th. The British marched out of the main road, and they surrendered the prisoners of war. 
George Washington was with his men. Cornwallis said he was sick, and so he didn't go with his men. People just said he was embarrassed and didn't want to come face to face with George Washington. But they had to lay down their weapons, and then they had to walk out. So this is a recreation. It's a, a Surrender Yorktown 1785 painting. Washington was ordered, had ordered Cornwallis to march his men from Yorktown at a precisely 2 p.m. But unforeseen delays held their exit till 3 p.m. And the now paved road directly to the right, which is right over here, was lined by American soldiers on the right, French soldiers on the left, and the British soldiers walked in between them. To walk where George Washington was, George Washington's headquarters right here. So to walk in this vicinity where George Washington actually was, where he was making his plans and his decisions. And this is five years into the war. And are we going to be successful? Are we going to win? What can we do now to ensure a victory? Just to be here is such a awesome thing for a historian. The morale that George Washington kept having to turn through hard summers during this battle for America's independence. It's just awesome and amazing to be here to the start of the American exper experiment and to see what it took to get this idea off the paper and into reality. So thank you. Thank you for joining me. I hope you make it out here someday. 240 year anniversary of the Battle of Yorktown.